Praise the Lord. James chapter 1, verse 17. Such a comforting scripture. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Hallelujah. I want to focus on this aspect of God. God being our heavenly Father, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What does that mean to us? That God, there's no shadow of turning in Him. Let me read a few different translations. The Weiss translation says, there is no shadow, no shadow is cast by the motion of turning. No shadow is cast by the motion of turning. The voice translation says, he is consistent. He won't change. He won't change his mind or play tricks in the shadows. The Bible in basic English says, with whom there is no change. With whom there is no change. And then the Weymouth The Weymouth says, not the slightest suggestion of change. Not the slightest suggestion of change. And then finally, God's Word says, the Father doesn't change like the shifting shadows. The Father doesn't change. There is no variableness, no changing, no shadow of turning. In other words, from every angle, He's light. From every angle, He's light. There's no dark side of God. Amen. There's no evil side of God. There's no wishy-washiness in His character. There, you're not going to catch God with a bad hair day. Amen. He's good all the time. All the time God is good. I mean, that's important. There's a lot of people who don't know that. There are a lot of people who are, are confused about that truth that God is good all the time. They think sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. They think that God will bring difficulties in the, into their life and, and use those difficulties that God authors destructions and God authors tragedies and God authors those things to teach them and to bring them closer to God. That's someone who thinks there's a, t- a turning in him, a variableness in him. And that person is going to have an inaccurate interaction with God. They're not going to have the capacity to receive from Him at the level of the person who knows God's character, who knows God is stable, who knows God by His Word. And so some people develop those ideas through wrong teaching. Some people develop those ideas through trying to figure out their circumstances and they want to know God by the circumstance and they say, well, God must have let it happen and so God must have wanted this to happen so that this would happen. They, God must have wanted me to have that car wreck so that I would be in the hospital bed next to so-and-so to witness to them or God wanted that person to experience that so that they would uh, come back to him. And that makes me think of a story that Charles Capps told about a true story of a father who would take his son every time they would hear the fire truck go out on a fire call. The, the dad, if they were available, they would put the son, he would say, come on, let's go watch the fireman. And he, the little boy was young. And after a few times of following the fire truck and watching the firemen put the fire out, the little boy asked the dad, Dad, why is this big red truck going around town starting fires all over town? He just assumed that since it was a fire and every time the fire occurred, the red truck was there, that it was the red truck causing the fire so that it could put the fire out. And a lot of people see God come to the rescue. And because God was there to rescue, when they called on God in 911, God showed up and rescued. And then they just assumed God sent the tragedy so I would call 911 and get his help. Do you see the, the lack of knowledge? 
that causes people to accept that wrong thinking and in accepting that wrong thinking they have an image of God and an interaction with God that's not based on the word. But we see that there is no shadow of turning in God, that he is stable. God is stable and he is our refuge. Go with me to Psalm 62. Psalm chapter 62. I want to look at verse 2 to begin with. Because what I want us to recognize is God as a stable refuge for our life. That our life is not supposed to be up and down, here and there, in and out. That our life is not supposed to be a series of of chaos after chaos after chaos. But that God desires to bring His stability into our lives so that He is our refuge. And then we begin to build our life upon His stability. And Psalm 62 verse 2 says, He only is my rock and my salvation. God only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. The center column reference, the marginal reference in my Bible says high place. He only is my defense, my high place. I shall not be greatly moved. Hallelujah. This is what God wants in your heart and my heart as a continual declaration He wants us to be so confident in His keeping ability, in His protecting ability, in His promoting ability that we are not moved by what we see. We're not moved by what we feel. We're not moved by how it looks. We're not moved by the circumstance, by the situation. We're not moved by whatever fluctuations in the world's economy. We're not moved by whatever CNN is promoting or or, uh, ABC or CBS. Or We're not moved by anything else except by the Word of God and the Word of God doesn't move us. It establishes us. He is our defense. He is our strong tower. Look at verse 6. It says, He only is my rock. He only is my rock and my salvation. Again, He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge. This word refuge is a word that is oftentimes defined or translated as stronghold. God is a refuge. God is a stronghold. He wants you to know him as your stronghold. He wants you to establish him as your refuge. He's the one you trust in. He's the one who's going to keep you. He's the one who's going to protect you. He wants you to know that the covenant you have with God is based on better promises than the covenant that the children of Israel were receiving from when God kept light in Goshen while it was so dark in Egypt they couldn't see. While God protected them from the frogs and protected them from all of the plagues, there was water to drink for the Egyptians. There was supply for the, for, I mean, for the Israelites. There, there was a supply of light. There was a supply of protection for the Israelites. While the Egyptians didn't have any hope, they had a refuge. God wants you to know him as that refuge. And it is something that we have to determine. We have to set that as our objective. And then we have to begin uh, working on that with our daily interaction with him. So that we develop this security in God. That we develop knowing him as our refuge. Nahum 1.7 Nahum 1.7 also uses this phrase. Hallelujah. Nahum 1.7 refers to the Lord as our refuge, our stronghold. 
It says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, a stronghold in the day of trouble, a stronghold in the day of trouble. You want to know your way to the stronghold before the day of trouble comes. You want to have established him as a stronghold before any adversity appears. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust in him. Now, our previous text, and you'll find it mirrored throughout many scriptures, our previous text said, trust in the Lord. Trust in him, O ye his people. Trust in him, trust in him, because trust is a connection to God. Trust is that open door for him to minister his protection to us. So it says he knows them that trust in him. Hallelujah. He is a stronghold. Now, because God is a stronghold, there's no variableness in him. There's no shadow of turning. There's no instability in God. He wants to take his stability and his establishing power and bring it into your life so that you become an immovable saint, so that you become so grounded and rooted in the love that God has for you and so grounded in the word of God, so established in the word that you are not tossed to and fro, that you are not moved by the circumstances or situations, but that you remain stable even in times that are not. And so he provides us his word. He provides us his word to establish our lives in his refuge. He gives us his word so that we can take his word and build it into our lives until we are living out the word of God. We are living in the word and the word is living in us. And so the word in us is what provides that stability or that unchangeableness and that protection and establishing in our life. Psalm chapter 119, he is referring to his word and the stability that his word provides. And he tells us in Psalm 119 and verse 89... Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The word is already settled. The word is established. It is, that word settled is a word that would also be established or it is, it has its foundations. So when we accept the word of God and we begin to interact with the word on a daily basis, we are interacting with something that is eternally founded. We are bringing into our heart and into our mouth something that is eternally established. Hallelujah. And then we're applying it. We're being doers of it and we're applying that established word into our life and it causes our life to be established. It causes our life to be secure, to be safe, to be, to be uh, rooted It says in Matthew 24, and this is just one of the references for this scripture because it is uh, uh, also identified in other places, but we'll look specifically at 2435. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Well, I, I, I expect to see the moon or the stars when I look out my window at night. I expect when I look out in the morning to see a blue sky. I I hope to see a blue sky. Sometimes it's a cloudy sky, but mostly blue, right? I hope to see the sky above my head and the earth beneath my feet. I expect it, but he said there will come a time because these are not founded. These are not founded. These are things we can see. These are things that we are, uh, are building certain natural things upon, but they're not eternal. The heaven and earth shall pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. So I don't want to just put all my hope in those natural, seen, temporal things. He says, 
my words shall not pass away. God's words are eternal. They are eternal. His word is eternal. And so if I build my life on his word, then I am building my life in a place, a spiritual geographical location of the word of God that has greater solidity than the sky above my head or the earth beneath my feet. It has a greater um, capacity or a longevity than those things. It is eternal. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. Hallelujah. We're looking at the unchangeableness of God and he has placed his unchangeableness in his word so he could distribute it to us. He said, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The word of our God shall stand forever. So God's not changeable. God is, is not uh, shifting. God is not unstable God, or unstable. God is established. And then he put that in his word. His word is established. And he's provided his word so that we could live by it. So that we could use his word to bring his unchangeable, established, stable life into being in our, in our family, in our life. Amen? So he's given us of this word to establish. The word establish. The word establish means to set or fix firmly. To set or fix firmly. Unalterably. To settle permanently, to settle permanently. Hallelujah. So he desires for our lives to be established and he provides his word to make that, to provide that in our life. Luke chapter 6. Hallelujah. Jesus taught this same truth using a very clear illustration. Verse 47 of Luke 6, he said, Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. So now we are recognizing an instruction, a pattern a template, if you will. He said, here's my sayings and does them. Here's my sayings. John 6 and verse 63, Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. My words are not just human words. My words are spirit and they are life. God said in Isaiah 55, he said, my word will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I send it to do. God said, my word, he said, my word will not return to me empty. It will not return empty. Why? Because it didn't go out empty. Every word of God is full of power. Every word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the Bible says the word of God is energizing. It's active, energizing. It's alive. Every word of God is full of creative power. Every word that God speaks is full. And he said, every word that I speak is productive. It will accomplish. And how does he get his will done? He said, it will accomplish what I please, what I want. So what God wants, he puts it in his word and he sends his word. He sends his word to get done what he wants. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, my word will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish. So there is, there is power in the word to accomplish the will of God. And then he said, it will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. It will prosper. And that word prosper means push forward. It means break it down. It means come mightily against. 
So the word of God is what he has provided for us to come against and, and, and push away those hindrances and those things from the curse. He wants us to take his word and use his word to establish our lives and to defend our lives from the things of this world or from the curse that's operative in this world or from the enemy. Amen? So he said, my word will accomplish what I want it to accomplish. It will, uh, it will accomplish my will. He said, my word will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Notice the sending of the word. Notice the application of the word. So Jesus said, hearing and doing is how we bring that word of God into a place where it can operate in our life. Hearing and doing, not just hearing. We can get really skilled at hearing and miss the doing. Amen. It's possible. We've all done it where we've heard it and we've heard it and we've heard it, but we haven't taken that step to act on it. There was a man in the book of Acts who was listening to Paul preach. He heard Paul preach to the point that he had faith to be healed. But if Paul had not have been sensitive to the Spirit to look at that man and to recognize this man has faith to be healed and he spoke to him a, a command for him to act on because he had been hearing, but he hadn't acted on what he had heard yet. Faith came, but he needed to act on that faith. Glory to God. And so Jesus said hearing and doing. Jesus said hearing and doing establishes his word in our life. So we've got to become proficient, not just in the hearing. And we do, hearing is important and we emphasize it. We're a faith building church. We emphasize, emphasize the hearing of the word because faith comes by hearing. And the sower, the parable of the sower says, the sower sowed the word and sowed the word. And these are they which heard. And these are they which heard. And these are they which heard. They all heard the word. Amen. So the hearing is important. But the doing of the word, the acting, the living and putting it to work and making it what we stand on, the establishing of the word in our life is by the doing of what we hear. We hear it to receive it and get it in our heart in a, in a flow of faith so that flow of faith can then be applied to our situation by the speaking it forth or by the acting upon it, by the forgiving those who have done uh, aught against us, by, by uh, um, uh, casting our care upon the Lord. Those are doings of the word. You can hear that and then hold on to your worry and hold on to your care and you can hear it and not be a doer of it. Amen. So being a doer of it is to cast that care. Being a doer of the word is to forgive if you have ought against any. Amen? Amen? Those are things that are the doings of the word of God. Not just the hearings, but the doings of the word of God. So we want to become proficient in both so that we are hearing and doing because this is how we're going to establish the word in our life. That's what we want. We want to develop a stronghold of the word. God is a refuge. He's a stronghold for us. And we want to develop his strongholds in our life. We want to have a stronghold of healing in our life. We want to have a stronghold of faith in our life. We want to have a stronghold of love in our life. Amen? Because those are refuges. Those are safeties for us. Those are establishings of the Lord in our life. And it's not something that you can do in one hearing. It's something that is applied throughout our lives of hearing the word, continuing in the word, and letting the word abide in us. Amen. Lift your hands and say, thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you for the word. Thank you, Lord, for the stronghold of your word that establishes us. We're established in the word of God. We're kept by that word. We are secure in that word. Amen. Hello, everyone. We are so excited about what God's doing in your life and in the ministry of Faith Builders. Michelle and I wanted to take a moment today and talk to you about partnership. And I know there's a lot of talk about partnering with ministries and 
Uh, that word partnership is used a lot, but it's a spiritual principle. Yes. And I want you to look in the book of Philippians chapter four. Uh, very often we go right to verse 19, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. But it starts back in verse 15. And Paul says, now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. The word communicated in the Greek means to give or to share in all good things. The Amplified uses the term, no, no church opened up a credit and debit account with me or with this ministry except you. Yes. So Paul says that this church at Philippi entered into a giving and receiving relationship with him. As they gave into his ministry, they received. Now, the easy thing to look and see there is that that's financial. But the aspect of it is there's a spiritual connotation as well. When you get involved in partnering with a ministry and you open up that credit and debit account, he says God will supply all of your need yes. according to his riches in glory, his riches of anointing, his riches of glory, his riches of spiritual victory, and his riches of physical finances. I want to encourage you today, if you've not yet partnered with us, I want to encourage you to do so because the blessing of the Lord will begin to function in your life in unprecedented man ways because you enter into this account with us as we spread the gospel. God bless you. Thank you for your partnership. We have many ways that you can connect with us through your generous giving or prayers. Not only will your seed into this ministry help spread the gospel, it will produce a harvest in your own life. You can sow online, by mail, or by phone. Thank you for your faithful partnership. This is Pastor Philip Steele, and I want to invite you out to Little Rock's new Word of Faith Church, Faith Builders Church, right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our address is 10500 Markham. We have services Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday nights at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., our hour of power. If you're hungry for the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, if you're hungry for the moving of the Holy Ghost, then we're the church for you. We value the Word of God and believe that the Word of God is the answer to all of your problems. We have a whole slate of services that are available for your family. We have nursery ministry, children's ministry, and youth ministry, all geared towards building your faith and framing your world by the Word of God. I'd really love to see you. Come and see us. And until then, God bless you.